Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Rod Him. I'm Janice. And this is Quick Study Television, a television program designed to take you through the Bible from Genesis to Revelation in one year. We're very excited about that. Somebody to help us do that is Corey. Corey, what's up? Today, we're going to be taking a look at some of the latest inquiries into the location of Mount Sinai. You know, she's doing these location business and mm -hmm. these nature, these uh, covering of the nations. It's excellent. Very, very good. What did you study today? We are going to talk a little bit about vows. We read about them in Numbers chapter 30. This is, yeah, this is the vows that the men take for the mm -hmm. women. That's interesting. We'll talk about that and more. Ryan, what's up today? Today, I'm going to be attempting to answer a seemingly hard question that Bible critics have put forward. And here it is. Does God both condemn and condone murder? Does he condemn and condone murder? Wow, that's interesting. And remember, in the teaching segment in just a moment, we'll talk about men and women and their whole relationship to vows. are going to look into one of the controversies uh, in regards to the location of Mount Sinai. This is one of the greatest mysteries uh, left to be solved about the Old Testament of the Bible. Uh, so today we're going to delve in and take a look at the traditional site of Mount Sinai and a few of the other locations uh, with some updated research, some more recent research. So take a look. Mount Sinai was a significant meeting place between God and ancient Israel, and it's a place today that has yet to be identified. There are dozens of mountain candidates for biblical Mount Sinai, despite the Bible's efforts in giving us two detailed itineraries on how the ancient Israelites arrived there. These two itineraries are similar in style and form to Egyptian itineraries that served as a kind of ancient map. The trouble that modern scholars have when attempting to follow these list maps is that most of the locations mentioned by them were not cities or established settlements. Landmarks and way stops like these were often called different names by the different cultures living at that time, and the route traveled depends on where you locate the crossing of the Reed Sea. Thankfully, there are also limitations put on the location of Mount Sinai by the scriptures. It's known that the route Israel took was not the northern road out of Egypt along the coast of the Mediterranean, so a central to southern route into the Sinai Peninsula should be preferred. It's also recorded in Deuteronomy that it is an 11 day journey by the way of Mount Seir or Edom to get from Mount Sinai to Kadesh Barnea. There are two modern candidates for Kadesh Barnea, but thankfully, they are only 10 kilometers apart, so either location serves the purpose of establishing a range that any serious candidate for Mount Sinai must lie within. This range is developed by using ancient sources to come to a standard understanding of what a day's journey's distance was. Scholars generally agree that anywhere from 24 to 37 kilometers was intended. Using those figures, a minimum and maximum distance from Kadesh Barnea can be calculated. Another issue is whether one should look for Mount Sinai in the Sinai Peninsula or in ancient Midian, modern-day Saudi Arabia. Some point to Galatians 4, when the Apostle Paul says Mount Sinai is in Arabia. From cross-referencing ancient sources, it's clear that first century Arabia did include the Sinai Peninsula, so Galatians 4 doesn't truly help the investigation. You know, when you first begin to look at uh, the location of Mount Sinai, it's it's a little surprising right off the top of your research that the location has been lost. I mean, there are so many other Old Testament locations that archaeologists have been able to identify, and Exodus and Numbers give a step-by-step -step itinerary, an ancient how to get to Mount Sinai uh, written out map. So why is it so difficult to locate? Why did Mount Sinai not become a place of pilgrimage like the Jerusalem temple did, like the tent tabernacle did when it was uh, being uh, kept in Shiloh before there was a temple. Well, one of the answers, potential answers to this question is that Mount Sinai was an initial point of contact between Moses, God, and Israel. But the presence of God did not stay on Mount Sinai. And that was the point. God made a covenant with Israel and instructed Israel to make a 
ceremonial tent of meeting, a tent tabernacle, and the presence of God would meet with the people at that tent and travel with them. So the presence of God effectively left Mount Sinai to, to abide with the Israelites through the tent tabernacle. Now Shiloh, where the tent tabernacle was kept for many years during the time period of the judges, it became a period of pilgrimage because you could meet with the presence of God there. Later on, the temple uh, became the housing pr place for the presence of God and it too became a place of pilgrimage. You know, the Bible, the 66 books by 40 authors over thousands of years, the Bible is the Word of God. It speaks what God commanded. One reality in the Word of God is that men and women have different roles. Now, it's important to remember that the Bible speaks clearly and directly about this and how we are to interpret it. Never does the Bible say, never does the Bible say that men and women are unequal in their worth or their value of their souls. Men and women are equal. In fact, Galatians tells us that men and women are basically the same. But in the instance of roles, they are different. One thing sin did when released on the planet by our first family was to change the roles and the bias of the truth about how we interact. Now, Numbers chapter 30 gives an example of those biases. Men were to take responsibility for the women in their lives. They were to listen and they were to consider what they say. But the word of their mouth was accomplished only by the men giving permission over their care. Numbers 30, verses 1 through 8. Then Moses spoke to the heads of the tribes concerning the children of Israel, saying, This is the thing which the Lord has commanded. If a man makes a vow to the Lord, or swears an oath to bind himself by some agreement, he shall not break his word. He shall do according to all that proceeds out of his mouth. Or if a woman makes a vow to the Lord and binds herself by some agreement while in her father's house in her youth, and her father hears her vow and the agreement by which she has bound herself, and her father holds his peace, then all her vows shall stand, and every agreement with which she has bound herself shall stand. But if her father overrules her on the day that he hears, then none of her vows nor her agreements by which she has bound herself shall stand, and the Lord will release her because her father overruled her. If indeed she takes a husband while bound by her vows or by a rash utterance from her lips by which she bound herself and her husband hears it and makes no response to her on the day that he hears, then her vows shall stand and her agreements by which she bound herself shall stand. But if her husband overrules her on the day that he hears it, he shall make void her vow which she took and what she uttered with her lips by which she bound herself, and the Lord will release her. Numbers chapter 30, verses 1 through 8. You know, the first thing that takes its dive in any war or any conflict is truth. Uh, truth is not spoken of well in conflict. And truth can be defined by the enemy or can be defined by the good person, or maybe the good person is the enemy, maybe the enemy is the bad person. Maybe it depends on where you're at. Truth is important, beloved. God's word is truth. Get out your Bible guide, and if you don't have it, you can write to us at the address in America or Canada or 
British address, please write for it and ask for it, give an offering in any amount. Or you can go to www.biblediscoverytv.com, biblediscoverytv.com. Click on donate here and it'll take you to the pages that you want to see with the Bible guide. You can download them. But in our Works of Faith segment, segment, I see this. There's no question about this. As we look at this and we consider it, truth spoken. Truth, not just the truth. Not just the truth, the truth spoken. Very important. As we understand what God is saying to us, we read Numbers chapter 28 through 31. Now, this is important because we're going through the Bible. And if you read that with us, congratulations, we're going through it. But we're going to look at today Numbers chapter 30, verses 1 through 8. And as we focus on this, we need to ask the Lord, Father God, in Jesus' name, help us to see what it is that you're telling us today. Help us, Lord, to understand what you're saying. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we've prayed now, and let's look at the scripture. In Numbers chapter 30, verses 1 through 2, the Bible says, Then Moses spoke to the heads of the tribes concerning the children of Israel, saying, This is the thing which the Lord has commanded. If a man makes a vow to the Lord, or swears an oath, makes a vow, or swears an oath to bind himself by some agreement. So he makes an oath, or he swears an oath, or he makes a vow to bind himself to some agreement. He shall not break his word. He shall not break his word. He shall do according to all that proceeds out of his mouth. Very important. Beloved, it's important to realize that what we say is what happens. God keeps track of all the things we say and do. We must be concerned about what we say, especially in today's world where we speak in an atmosphere of hyperbole. Everything is exaggerated. We need to understand that, you know, hyperbole is good once in a while, and you have to explain to people you're using a hyperbole, but good once in a while, but we really shouldn't broadcast or say very much in hyperbole. We should say what we mean. Now, I, listen, I have had this problem in my life. In, in my early life, I used to say all kinds of things, and I've, as my life has gone on, I've, I've said, Lord, that, man, that hurt. You know, in the last 10 years, Lord, oh man, that hurt. I need to be careful what I say and how I say it. And I'm still trying to be careful what I say and how I say it. Very important that we understand our mouth speaks words that link us. Now, I have invited Jesus Christ in my life, so that changes things. But it's very important. We go on in the scripture now. Listen to this. Or if a woman makes a vow to the Lord and binds herself by some agreement while, her, while in her father's house in her youth, not married, and her father hears her vow and is an agreement by which she has bound herself and her father holds his peace, he holds his peace, then all of her vows shall stand and every agreement with which she is bound herself shall stand. Now listen to this, verse 5. But if her father overrules her on the day that he hears, then none of her vows or her agreements by which she has bound herself shall stand. And the Lord will release her because her father overruled her. Fascinating. What a woman promises or vows is made true with her father's agreement. Men are responsible for what the women or the woman's vow or promises are. This is what the Bible says. Now, I realize that in today, you know, um, men and women are equal. The Bible says that, but we've tried to make the roles equal, and that is wrong. We are wrong in many ways. In our society, our culture is wrong. That's what the Bible says, and I believe the Bible. So it's important for us to recognize the roles and to realize that men, we are responsible. We need to pay attention to what our wives say. And wives need to be aware of this as well. We go back to chapter 30, verse 6. It says, if indeed she takes a husband, this is a husband now, while bound by her vows or by her rash utterances, that's a very important statement, by a rash utterance, 
a rash utterance is something that's done unthinkingly, but bound by a rash utterance from her lips by which she bound herself and her husband hears it and makes no response to her on that day, which he hears, then her vow shall stand and her agreements by which she bound herself shall stand. But if her husband overrules her on that day that he hears it, he shall make void her vow, which she took and which she uttered with her lips, by which she bound herself on the Lord that will release her. This brings us to the point. The husband takes responsibility for what his wife speaks. We are to come into agreement with God's word. Now, this is so important. Husbands, I realize that we're living in today. I realize that I get it. But we need to assume our responsibilities, not to tell women they can't say things, but we need to understand our responsibilities according to the Bible. And we need to pay attention and pray this through and say, Lord, what does this mean to my marriage today? Thank you for staying with us as we continue to go through the Bible in one year. It is great. And I want to remind you that on the next program, again, we're talking about the children of God hearing from the Lord as he speaks to them. This is very important as we study these particular chapters. Right now, here's Ryan. Well, today we're exploring a supposed contradiction in the Bible that critics believe is a doozy. They ask, does God both condemn murder and condone it, as seems to be the case when we read the Bible? Let's study. Bible critics accuse the scriptures of being full of errors and contradictions. One of these alleged contradictions is that in the Bible, God apparently both condones murder and condemns murder. God commands in Exodus 20:13 that you shall not murder. Yet he also commanded Joshua to eliminate the Canaanites and others in Deuteronomy 20, 16 to 18, and condoned and even helped David kill Goliath, as recorded in 1 Samuel 17, 50. To answer this supposed contradiction, we must first make a very important distinction. Murder is different than killing. Murder is the unlawful taking of a life, but killing can be lawful or unlawful according to God. Critics create a false dilemma here by assuming that killing is always right or always wrong according to God's law. This, however, is not true. God established in his law when killing was lawful and when it was not lawful. For example, if one plotted the murder of somebody else, it was lawful for the murderer to receive the death penalty. However, if one killed another out of self-defense, it would not be lawful for him to receive the death penalty. This is important because in each case in the Bible where God condones killing, it is lawful. For example, Joshua was commanded to eliminate the Canaanites and other nations because they were completely consumed by evil and were committing things like incest, sacrificing their children to their pagan gods, as well as many other things according to Leviticus 18. Additionally, God knew that his people would be corrupted by them if they did not kill them all. When we read about the giant Goliath, we see that he was blaspheming God's name, which was also punishable by death according to the law. Though many are offended at God for establishing lawful killing, it is God that is offended with us when we unlawfully take a human life created in his image. Indeed, it was humanity who allowed sin into the world in the first place, forcing God's hand into protecting us from killing one another. So then, murder and killing are different. Murder is the unlawful taking of life, but killing can be lawful or unlawful according to the scriptures. 
And as I said at the end of the segment, there are many people who become offended with God that he would even establish lawful killing. But remember, it's humanity's fault that God had to do that. It was us who first let sin into the world when we listened to the devil in the garden. Therefore, God had to establish lawful killing in order to prevent us from murdering each other. We can see from this that there's absolutely no contradiction here. But this is fascinating, Ryan, because there's a lot of people who um, have, I remember a story of a man who was in church and he had been in the war. And uh, the problem was that he had to, he was ordered to attack the enemy. And of course, in a war, you know, with Nazi Germany and the rest of it, mm -hmm. you're attacking an enemy and you're taking life. And that whole thing was up there and he came to peace with this by reading that and seeing the difference between murder and killing. But still, it is not good for any life to be gone or, or removed. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, this is fascinating. Yeah, we're it all, really is. We're all humans created in the image of God, right? Yeah. So when there's a loss, I mean, it's a loss. Yeah, yes. I mean, it's true. You know? It's so. true. I mean, I, I can't imagine uh, how that would be. And uh, so and I've known a number of people who have done things, you know, in the government and they've asked these questions and they've said, you know, I don't know about this. And, you know, I, it's just it's just something that you have to deal with as you go along, because anytime your life is being taken, you know, that's the, it's something that you're doing. But if you don't take a life, he's going to take two lives. If you don't take his one life. Mm -hmm. You know, by taking his one life, you remove him from taking a bunch of lives. Yeah. So it's just it's a, a difficult world of thing. sin, right? Yeah, it yeah. really is. It really is. So this is fascinating. Very, very interesting. You should teach that to all the police officers okay. and all the people out there in law enforcement. But anyway, uh, what did you study today? Well, of course, we're talking about vows. And there are subjects that we read about in God's word that we find hard to, to try to meld with our own thinking. And I can speak to this issue as a woman because of some of the things within the last, say, 50 or 60 years with different women's movements. And unfortunately, a lot of times the Bible gets thrown under the bus that it somehow thinks lesser of, of women. And that's just simply not true. I don't know how you feel in your heart, ladies who are listening, but it's not true. And you may have been told that, and you may even see shades of that in the word. But if you take the word in context in its entirety, which is what we aim to do every year, we start in Genesis and we go through Revelation. We don't just pick sections that are comfortable or the things that we like. And this section talking about vows, we're, we're feeling sometimes when we read it like, oh, well, are we as women seen as a lesser value or that our words don't matter? And that's not it at all in here. So if that's what you're thinking, clear your mind of that and understand that there are different roles. In God's eyes, we're all equal. We are all the sons of God, which means that we're equal. We as women have the same inheritance as men do. But in marriage, if you are married and you are a Bible-believing, God-fearing, reverencing him and understanding his word, we have different roles. We're exactly the same, but in, within the home and within that marriage, we have different roles. As we hear rash statements being made and the husband hearing it or the father hearing it, and if, he's, if he lets it go, then the woman has to fulfill that vow. But if the husband or the father steps in and says, wait a minute, something down the line, or I don't agree with this, we're going to, we're going to avoid that, it's actually a protection. So if we see it in the right context, it's not that our thoughts are lesser, but sometimes we say things and we, we, we come under, a, a, the protection is removed. So actually your husband, when you are married under God and you're a believer and your husband is a believer, he is accountable. He is accountable before God to be your protector and your provider. And it's a, a place of security and safety and provision, one that you can work together where you're not uh, trying to compete with each other, but it's common ground. I want to point to two vows that you might be familiar with that you wouldn't associate with this scripture that might help you to see it a little bit better. The uh, vow that Hannah made, and of course a vow is an un a conditional promise made in the context petitionary by prayer. And Hannah 
prayed to God. She was childless. She wanted a son so badly, and her husband knew that. And she went to the temple to pray, and, and she cried before God, and she said, if you give me a son, I will give him back to you, and, and I will never shave his head, which was a Nazarite vow. And she took that vow, and Rod, God honored her with a son, and she gave Samuel he was not a Levite, but she had made this promise to God and she fulfilled it. And later on, we find out that Hannah was blessed with other children. Another uh, vow that we hear is the mother of Samson. The angel went and appeared to her and her husband didn't. He, he wasn't with the angel of the Lord, but they got, to, got together. Uh, they were told how they would raise Samson and yeah. That's exactly what happened. So there are two vows that show that, uh, that situation where there's a husband and wife involved. I think that is great. And the important part of that is, and by the way, uh, when you talk about that vow with Samson, yep. the only reason that the angel went to the father is because he prayed. And the father said, oh, Lord, show us this man. And yes. so it says God heard his prayer. And, and Manoah, <laughs> Manoah uh, agreed to the arrangement. Of, yes. of how they were to raise Samson. Yes. So he actually made that vow. Absolutely. The, the two of them made that vow. Anyway. Absolutely. <laughs> Fascinating stuff. By the way, John the Baptist was named by God and so was Jesus Christ. Anyway, <laughs> interesting point. Uh, no Mere Book is the uh, DVD that yes. Ryan did. Did a great and, job. And uh, again, I'm going to ask you the same thing. What did you do? No Mere Book. Well, you know, this is an investigation of mine. It's years of research that I've done on this particular topic. And it's just basically demonstrating the supernatural origin of the Bible. And a couple examples, you know, I talk about the Bible codes, I talk about some numerology in the scriptures, all of that. So it's all really right. interesting. So make sure you write to us and send an offering of $25 or more so that we can send this DVD video to you. Very, very important. And I want you to remember that God is real and he's alive. And he sent his son, Jesus Christ, the one who gave his life for us. He gave his life for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. And that's so, so important. So he rose again, miraculously, seen in the flesh. And then he says to us as he ascends to heaven and then he later tells us, listen, come to me all you who are heavy laden, I will give you rest. Pray and ask Jesus Christ to come into your life, he will change you.